Hello, I am Therese Molino and welcome to The Edge. Our topic today is the importance of summer reading. Today, the reading habits of students are extremely flawed, especially during the summer. It is imperative that students develop good reading habits and maintain them not only throughout the school year, but throughout the entire year. I am a major procrastinator, especially when it comes to these summer assignments. Summer reading is often something I start working on only a week before school begins. This past summer, I was assigned two summer reading books, and I only read one of them due to something that many students suffer from, procrastination. Upon taking the test and writing my essay, I was extremely confused, even though I used Cliff Notes. I soon came to the realization that if I would have been more proactive and read the second book, it would have shown in my test and essay results. This is what motivated me to question the purpose of summer reading. I wanted to know why it was so important and why there was so much emphasis placed upon it. Upon conducting research, I discovered that summer reading can actually raise standardized test scores, keep up brain activity, and preoccupy kids, which, which can also keep them out of trouble. During the months of the summer, although summer reading can be a grueling and inconvenient burden for students, it is actually very beneficial to the developing minds of students. Over the summer, many students continually complain about their summers being taken away from them by summer reading assignments. English teachers continue to assign summer reading books for the purpose of benefiting their students and making more time for other curriculum during the school year. According to research, this has great benefits. Students have actually been proven to do worse on standardized tests at the end of the summer than they do at the end of the school year. Keeping up brain activity can be extremely beneficial towards long-term academic skills, especially those of, children's, of children whose brains are still rapidly developing. Studies show that at the end of sixth grade, Kids who lose reading skills over the summer break are two years behind their peers. Over the course of three months, children can very easily lose their reading abilities and habits if they are not put into use. Summer reading can pave the way for a successful school year. Although summer reading is quite beneficial, it will not reach its full effect if students do not read the books they were assigned. Oftentimes, the books chosen by teachers do not appeal to the students in the same way that books chosen directly by the students would. According to Scholastic, Nine out of 10 kids say they, am, say they are more likely to finish a book that they pick out themselves. Students who are given books that they would not normally choose to read on their own will most likely not even read the books at all. I conducted a survey on how many students have used SparkNotes, CliffNotes, or any other online summarization source instead of actually reading their summer reading books. My survey showed that 26 out of the 40 high school students I asked have used an online summarization source. This is a prime example of how most students do not actually put the time and effort into their summer reading books. If teachers take a different approach that is geared more towards the interests of students, more students would read. In order to spark the interests of students and benefit the students academically, summer reading novels should be more geared towards the students would act what they would actually want to read. With this different approach, it is likely that students will be more compelled to become avid readers throughout the entirety of the year. I'm, I'm here today with Mrs. Myra Olenek, and she is the Library Director at Peters Township District Library. So, Mrs. Olenek, um, why is it important that students should read if over the summer it's supposed to be meant for a break from academic things? Wow, well first of all, I loved your introduction. Thank I couldn't you. agree with you more on so many of your statements. But I would say, Therese, that reading through the summer is important for so many reasons. Uh, first of all, reading is thinking. And throughout the summer, you might think of it in terms of having that learning faucet turned off. And when you don't, consider, don't continue to have uh, topics of interest or uh, passions that you may have available to you, it is a way that the mind starts to not be able to focus. There have been a lot of studies that show in our hyper uh, focused or hyper networked world, I should say, with Twitter feeds and with in, um, your texting and so forth, that we really do, kids are finding, and adults too, a lack of focus. And to keep in focus over the summer when you have all of this time is probably one of the best times to read during the summer. You have the opportunity to read what you'd like. Now, I heard you say that you have a lot of books that are assigned, which maybe there can be a balance with that. But I think in reading those assignments, and probably the sooner you leave school, the better, um, would c help you to, to maintain the focus. And that is. I've been reading also, one of the most desired skills is to be able to have sustained focus on a really uh, 
detailed task in as far as our economy goes. They're looking for people, they're finding that people really don't have that ability anymore. They're losing that ability to focus. And no matter what the job would be, whether it would be a skilled labor type of job or something with computers, let's say, or uh, engineering or even teaching. So to maintain that focus, reading helps you to do that because as I said, reading is thinking. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I've heard from <coughs> a lot of my friends and myself as well that sometimes technology can be a distraction because if you're trying to read something, sometimes I know my phone will like distract me. But also, there are also there's also new technology of like Kindles and mm -hmm. things that provide like an like an e-book mm -hmm. almost in a way. So sure. would you say that technology helps the reading skills of students, or do you think it um, distracts them? Well, I think it could go both ways. Uh, at the library, for instance, we do have ebooks that you can download through Overdrive or Libby, which is a wonderful app. We have audiobooks. Uh, students actually listen. You listen on a higher level than you can read, so I don't see anything wrong with listening to audiobooks. Uh, there are so many blogs out there that offer ideas for students uh, for new choices, also things such as um, Goodreads, which is a wonderful way using your computer, getting the app to see what other people are reading and what they're recommending. So in a way, I see technology as a way to enhance it. But at the same time, like you were saying, you get interrupted and distracted. I was reading a study that said, for instance, student A, if they read 20 minutes a day, that results in 1,800,000 words that they would have read over a year. And that translates to 60 school days of, of time focused. Student B, who would read five minutes a day, is exposed to approximately 282,000 words in that year, which results to uh, 12 school days. And then student C, who would read maybe a minute of just focused time, really only amounts to about 8,000 words over the course of a year, which would result time spent to about three school days. So, and then you mentioned about standardized scores in your introduction, that's so true. That student A will find themselves in that 90th percentile, where student C will find themselves in the um, 10 percent percentile. Mm -hmm. So it definitely, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag with how you, and I think with anything there's balance. But I think if you keep that 20 minutes, that's a great way to see that reading requires stamina. And when we are distracted, we lose that sense of stamina, even just like with exercise. Mm. So how does reading often kind of improve speaking skills? Because I know in today's day and age with all of the technology and the texting and the social media, there's a lot of lack of you know, abbreviation and like basic grammar skills and students are typing things more than they're actually saying things. Mm -hmm. So how can reading help with that? Well, because in reading, when authors write, they're not writing so much for conversation like you and I are having. They really carefully choose their words, their vocabulary, which is why it's so important to, to read because you're being, uh, even the younger children are being introduced to words that maybe would never come up in a conversation with mom or dad or you with your peers. But an author is going to uh, introduce those vocabulary words to you that Maybe you don't need a dictionary to look it up, but through a context clue, you're reading and you think, oh, that's, so that's what that means. And you'll hear it maybe used more often. So authors really do have a craft, a very fine craft that they um, work on to improve and to engage their readers. So yes, they're, they're speaking to the emotions that maybe a student is having or the character in the book is having. Um, and then the vocabulary that they use and the comprehension that is required to actually follow that and to get you to turn the page and to not turn off the light at night, to keep reading. I'm sure you found books that kept you going. Uh, and it's, that's the author's skill at work. So those skills such as comprehension and vocabulary, mm -hmm. um, are those the skills that usually um, mm. make um, the trend in um, higher standardized test scores for students who read more, is that? Absolutely. Uh, definitely vocabulary, definitely comprehension, because really just even reading the question for these standardized test scores, and you know how long the tests are, once again, there's that stamina, the rigor that's involved. And just like training for a particular race that you might swim or run, 
the same idea applies. It really helps you to become comfortable with it. And you start to understand theme, you understand symbolism, because you're reading for meaning. As I said in the beginning, reading is thinking. It's so basic, but it's an active uh, type of sport, you might say, because you're constantly assessing, do I agree with that? Do I not agree with that? Wonder what he meant by that. Oh, this character, I'm so worried about what's going to happen next. So all of that, um, and you know, a lot of times kids will say, oh, I just don't like to read. But I think if you speak in terms of a growth mindset, they really haven't just found the book yet. They haven't found the right book or the right author to connect with. So all of that, I think, connects well with their writing and with their learning. Whenever I was younger, my parents always tried to have me read for 15 minutes a day, and I did not like that idea. <laughs> and I think I would really like to know how parents can really kind of encourage their students to have good reading habits at home, maybe by, I don't know if it would be a good idea if they were to have them read 10 minutes a day or if that's a good strategy well reading with them you know there's as I said before uh, we listen on a higher vocabulary level than we actually read on so when a parent reads to a child from a chapter book you know they are being introduced to that language that they would have never read in maybe a frog and toad book or elephant and piggy so having a parent sit down and having that quality time with their son or daughter right there on their lap the closeness that um, is naturally brought about with with a book book time um, you know you put your phone aside you really focus on that child uh, getting to know that character whether you s read the book first then go see the movie together there are lots of things you can do together as a family to make reading positive and to and for parents to model with their children even with their adult children you know hey I read this great article in um, in this week's newspaper or in Sports Illustrated um, letting your letting having parents let their kids know that they read too that they don't see it as as something that's unpleasant hmm. so i think that's all the i think that's all the time we have for this segment we will be back after a short break thank you To the edge. Um, we are talking about the importance of summer reading. Um, this is Mrs. Myra Olenek, in case you were just tuning in now. Um, so how can teachers really encourage their students to want to read? I know we touched upon how parents can do that by maybe setting a good example, but mm -hmm. how can teachers do that as well? Well, I think teachers also um, can set a good example by sharing some of their favorite stories with their young students, with their older students, having finding a connection, whether it's the genre, maybe it's a sci-fi book, maybe you didn't know that your teacher loves fantasy or is a real uh, biography bug. Those are the kinds of connections that uh, I would say that teachers can see, can, can make with their students. Go to the school library with them. You know, one of the hardest things I, I think happens is when a student walks into the library. They can be so intimidated by all of the books. Even how is it all organized? Do I just pick a book by the cover? Do I just grab the first one that's on the shelf? Is there a stack of reading recommendations that are uh, staff picks or teacher picks? I know at the library we try to do that on our website where we have books that we like that if someone's stumped, you know, where, what do I read next? So having conversations with their students, making sure that um, they go with them and inquire, what are you reading? So I would say um, finding out what is important to that student. What do they like? Uh, it, maybe they do like short, shorter books to get started with. That's fine. There's graphic novels out there that are almost like a um, cartoon, but they are really uh, well drawn, well scripted, and it might be a great introduction to a whole new genre. So I think what teachers want to do is open it up to their students so, and the, working with the school librarian, partnering with that. Uh, I would say encouraging their students to get library cards, to come to the public library. We have summer reading programs. We actually call it summer learning now because it's not just so much on the reading, but what, do you, what are you reading about? What are you learning? Last summer we had uh, Reading Rocks, so we did it in terms of music, but we also did it in terms of geology 
So there were so many um, wonderful programs that were set aside from our kindergarten students to our seniors in high school. Uh, great ideas that our staff has come up with that I think if uh, they took some time to visit the library, talk to our staff, they'd be surprised what wonderful uh, programs we have for them through the summer. This coming summer, 2019, it's going to be a universe of stories. So once again, pointing out the variety that's out there. There's definitely a book out there for each student. Mm. So a lot of times in school, teachers choose classic novels, which mm -hmm. are very important <laughs> um, in society. But do you, how could it be beneficial if, if teachers were to allow their students to maybe sometimes pick out books that they could read that they would choose instead of having to read the books that the teachers choose for them all of the time. I'm totally for that. I, I totally agree that, as I said, reading is personal, it's, it's independent, it's something that we as adults don't like to always be told what to read. Of course, you know, right now there's a big push from PBS, the 100 best books called The Great American Read. So they have the whole country voting and actually today's the day they're gonna reveal the, the winner tonight. But classics, but also something maybe that you, you know you read as a child, Charlotte's Web or some Agatha Christie. It's all over the board. And having books like that available, when I look at those lists, I think, oh my goodness, I haven't read um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy yet. Or maybe it was a book I didn't finish in high school. Those classics that are out there, or maybe some of the classics you're talking about, um, do you want to name one that maybe you didn't like or you, was on the list? Classic. Um, <coughs> I know I read To Kill a Mockingbird. I think okay. it's a wonderful book, but okay. a lot of my classmates did not like it. All it's right. a very long book. But <laughs> they, are long. They, <laughs> they are. Well, a book like that, you know, maybe sometimes pulling in some modern day connections to that book to see how how is it the same? How is it different now? And maybe setting a purpose for reading where you're looking for some other connections rather than just, I have to finish this book by the end of the summer. So I think reading with a purpose uh, sometimes is a good way to, to make a connection maybe over a, over a book that you might consider dry, but even to, to ponder, well, why is this book on all of these lists? We have Tim O'Brien coming here to the high school. The Things They Carried is one of those books that's <clears throat> you know, about Vietnam, but it was uh, labeled as one of the best books of the last quarter century. And, you know, we're going to, you folks read, or your seniors, some of the seniors are reading that here in high school and may not understand the connection, but when you see that he connects to the human spirit and the, um, the traumas that all people maybe carry, not necessarily physically in their equipment, but what do they carry deep in their soul and their heart and what, what weighs heavy on them. So even though things that maybe seem they don't pertain really do, a good author will find a way to make that connection. So I, I would say give those books a chance, but also I would also encourage those students to maybe start with something lighter. Start with some books that you're interested in, some John Green, uh, some other books that maybe you wouldn't have had assigned, but that'll help to build that stamina so that you will get ready. It's, it's more or less, you know, trying to run that marathon before you've run a 10K, you know, so start some of those uh, maybe more contemporary books and then ease into the other. So that's, that's a thought. Hmm. A lot of times teachers will assign reading, reading guides along with the books, and sometimes I feel like that that makes it seem like a chore okay. in a way. Um, so how could <clears throat> just maybe, for example, um, having this assigning a reading assignment and then having the students take a quiz on it as opposed to having them do the reading guide? So is the reading guide something they have to write answers yes. to? Yes. Oh, okay. So I guess it's a way to keep the, te the student on track? Yes. Okay. Well, I don't know. I guess that's different for each student. I know is, I remember reading Moby Dick. I went to high school here. We had to read Moby Dick. And uh, <laughs> I remember that if I hadn't been assigned those 50 pages every night, I probably wouldn't have finished it. But I, I looked at that, once again, kind of reading with a purpose. It helped me to stay on track and see where this book was headed. I think I would have missed a lot. Um, but, you know, you look at adult book clubs now, they're reading guides for all of those books. You know, a lot of the popular books that are out there in the back are 10 reading guide questions, you know, for the facilitator of the group. So, you know, it's not something, 
maybe not to look at it as a form of punishment, but as a way to get more out of the book because adults are doing it now all the time. We have a lot, we have over 20 book clubs that we have posted at the library of area adults that are reading. And many of the books that they're reading have discussion questions and reading guides in the backs. And they choose those books sometimes because they come with the questions. So it's, it's a way to provoke some thought. Mm. So whenever I was in middle school, we had these things called reading logs. And so what you would have to do is you'd have to choose a silent reading book and then you would fill in the reading log with maybe a quote or something from the certain chapter. Mm -hmm. um, and it was kind of a, a good way to keep track of your progress with the book. And it was also kind of a good way to maintain your, your comprehension. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess that's just a, a middle school thing. At least I went to a, I went to a private school, okay. kindergarten through eighth grade. Yeah. Um, but in the high school, we don't really have anything like that, um, ways to keep track. Mm -hmm. So how, how can students really keep track of what they're reading and how often? Um, well, you know, if you use ebooks, they keep track for you. That keeps it track. There's a log, you know, it'll, it'll keep a little uh, reading list for you, which is great. Um, that's why I like ebooks. I like e audio books as well. Uh, even in the library, it'll keep track for you. You can ask to maintain a reading list. And you can, anytime you go, you can say, oh, can you print out my list? Because sometimes we have adults who, we just have a brand new book called A Thousand Books to Read Before You Die. And it's about that thick. And there's a lot of books in there that I'll be thinking, did I read that book? I don't remember, did I read that one? So I kind of wish that I had maybe written more books down there or did I not finish that book? So maintaining a reading list at the library is fine. Uh, you know, you can do that at a public library. Uh, you can probably do it on your phone. Goodreads, I'm telling you, is a wonderful resource out there that will connect you because they'll say, you like this book? Then try this one. And you can keep your, your reading lists right there on Goodreads, mm. which is a nice way to network with folks. There are blogs, there are podcasts. It, it's, it's amazing what's out there if you look and, it, and make it simple. Mm. I wouldn't say, you know, it seems tedious to have to write down every page number, but if you just want to keep each, uh, you know, a few impressions after you finish a book, it's a great way to then tell someone else about the book. We have a wonderful, um, I'll mention this resource called Novelist. And in Novelist, they have appeal terms. So if you like dystopian, or if you like romance, or maybe you like uh, thrillers, putting in appeal terms in the search will then bring you the books that may fit you, uh, you know, fit your interest, and then they'll give you read-alikes. So that's another way to just click those off, make yourself a folder, and save those titles of your to-be-read pile. That's known as a TBR pile, but like on my Nightstand, I have a lot of books to be read that I want to get to, but you know, there's only so many, mm -hmm. so much time. How can finding the right book really have an effect on students? Like how can it really make them want to read more and maybe even have an impact on them emotionally? Like let's say they were going through something in their lives that this book really spoke to them. How can it affect them in that sort of way? Oh, it can affect them their whole life through. Uh, books, I think in terms of as being mirrors or windows where you see yourself in the book as a mirror or you see someone else or someone in your family or a dear friend and making a connection with a character or a book title will stay with you your whole i still remember my third grade teacher reading charlotte's web to me and crying and i was crying so there are just certain connections and you know i can't go to a barn now without thinking about wilbur the pig um so and that's actually one of the books on that uh for the pbs great american read so obviously a book from childhood can stay with you to adulthood so there is power in the written word and when you can make that connection that's why it's important to read a lot because you know you just maybe haven't found that book yet but it's out there and once you do and you find that author you connect with you will have so many wonderful days ahead uh, and nights ahead just spending time going traveling in your mind to different places learning things wonderful quotes there are some authors that i'll read something you were mentioning quotes i'll write down a quote because a character said something that i thought was fantastic mm. so there's plenty of ways to make the connection and it's well worth the read. So how can really, um, how can students finding good ways to maintain their reading habits and just kind of making it a part of their life, how can that really pave the way for the future? Maybe whenever they're getting a job in the future, mm -hmm. could it help with speaking skills or could oh. it just really 
help them emotionally or help them with their interactions with others. So what really are the ways in which it does that? Well, I think just mentioning, a, asking the question, what are you reading? Read, read any good books lately? It seems like so simple, but it is such a great way to make an immediate connection with someone. Uh, breaks the ice whether you are you know sitting next to someone on a subway and they have a book in their in their lap and you see them engaged in it ask them about it um, sharing just like I said that very simple question carrying books with you or let's go to the library let's see what's on the new red new new shelf we have all of our new books displayed reading the the New York Times book reviews seeing whatever other people are reading wondering what's all the buzz about why did this book become a movie and even uh, maybe setting up a book club with your with your own friends and reading the book first then seeing the movie and you start to really see how much is lost on the screen that they can't capture that an author can so you know just I think having conversations and that helps you to articulate what you like about a book helps you to understand no I really didn't like that book and it's okay to not like a book it's okay to not finish a book you know that's the power of uh, of reading it's it's, it's personal, as I've said before, but it's also something that you can just put away if you don't like. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today. So to recap, summer reading has its many benefits towards, towards students' brains, even though it takes up much time and energy. It plays an essential role in helping to mold the minds of children and keep their academic skills from getting rusty. In order to increase the participation of students in summer reading, there needs to be a change on the teacher's part in which the way they assign summer reading and on the student's part, importantly, by making changes to their work ethic. The purpose of summer reading should be to get students to read. In order to fulfill this purpose, teachers should really try to get the students more into summer reading by encouraging independent reading as well. A possible alternate approach could be that the teachers could conduct a vote on which book the students want to read. In order to get students to read, they must want to read. If teachers are able to get more students to read in the summer, it could potentially spark their desire to read for pleasure throughout the entire year. Thank you so much, Mrs. Olenek, for coming in. Well, and thank you for bringing this important topic to the community. Well worth it, thank you. Thank you.